Hey everyone, I'm Mel. I'm the editor of Yoga Lifestyles as well as a certified yoga teacher. Today we'll be talking to Kelsey Evans. She is also a yoga teacher, a mental health advocate, and she's getting her PhD. Kelsey, I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Can you start off by telling me a little bit about who you are? Uh, my name is Kelsey Evans and I currently have my 500 RYT uh, and I teach in the Orlando area and currently I'm pursuing my doctorate in mindfulness and education at University of Central Florida. Awesome, so even before we get into yoga, what made you want to pursue your doctorate? Well, honestly, um, my first 200 RYT was the one that honest, like, it pushed me into wanting to study more about like, what mindfulness was. So I used to be a high school teacher and I taught like literally every subject in the book for social studies, so it was a lot. And I had a lot of different uh, classes that I taught and different students that I would see every day. So one of the things that I noticed was their high levels of stress and they kept getting worse and worse every single year. So then once I uh, did my 200 RYT, I came back with a specific amount of knowledge, not only in yoga and asana, but more about how to introduce meditation specifically to a student. So I tried it out in my classroom and I tried it out for a year. And um, the coolest part about it was seeing their personal growth, but it also improved their test scores. So one of the things that I saw, um, like in Florida, you have this thing called an end of course exam, and they're horrible. <laughs> like it's, it's like every kid's worst nightmare, and that's probably why they're stressed out all the time, because they're testing, testing, testing. The FCAT? Yeah, they got rid of the FCAT. What? Yeah, so Finally. things have changed. No, it's called the FSA now. Yeah, there's just tons of testing going on. So um, I taught a course uh, for United States history that was an uh, end of course exam course. So it was interesting to measure from the first year that I started teaching to the very last, like before I left uh, high school teaching. Um, I did a compare contrast over time. In the last year that I did um, mindfulness in the classroom, I compared the test scores and I ended up getting the fourth highest in the state like out of all the thousands of schools. And it was amazing considering it, initially the first group of students that went through the test that I taught, uh, they had about a 70% pass rate, but by the very end, it was 98%, which is phenomenal and very rare. So I was like, okay, like I'm, I'm done teaching high school for now. I really wanna study the phenomenon that happened in my classroom so that I can bring it to other students that really need it. So I took about a year off and um, I had to go through and study for the GRE, which is pfft, like it's another test. So um, I was able to get into my doctorate program uh, a year down the road. So uh, now I'm in my second year and I'm about to start writing my dissertation. And um, the funny thing is, is that like nobody bought into the idea of mindfulness when I first got to UCF. Um, it took a lot of effort and continually explaining like why it was beneficial because they see me and they're like, oh, you're a yogi. Of course you would say that mindfulness works, which it does. But from the academic standpoint, there's really not a lot of research currently out there of what's happening in the classroom. And it's just recently started but that's kind of fueled my fire of me being uh, one of the leaders currently studying mindfulness in education. So that's kind of like the long story short, but essentially why I wanted to get my doctorate is I saw a need and I saw students really stressed out and there's really not anything, um, anything in the school system that teaches them character and just to how to be a kid or how to grow up mindfully and with a different set of morals. So I saw that need, I was like, well, you know, yes, it's nice to have a paycheck in the teaching career, but I would rather set that aside and, you know, be, be poor for a little bit just so that I can improve the education system. So cool, how, like what was the biggest difference that you saw on your students and how they interacted with each other besides test scores? Like yeah. what did you notice with them? It's funny because uh, this is the academic side of me talking where I'm like, oh, test scores, data, wonderful. 
But the best part about it is like you said, the change in their interpersonal life and their relationships with each other and also themselves. So what happened, and this was a really cool transformation, is over time, they saw my classroom as a safe space. So then they would come and hang out with me at lunch, which like I was fine with, you know, I was just grading and then talking with them, but they saw it as something that was a lot safer than the lunchroom. And then they were able to connect with the other students around them that also saw my classroom as a safe space. So the more that I taught them just to be and to release their stress and release their anxiety and depression, um, the more that they became authentic with themselves. And it was really cool to see, I think that one of the best experiences that I had with this is um, one of my kids, and this happens quite frequently in education, uh, one of my students was Baker acted. And um, so when she got back from being Baker acted, that was actually when I started teaching the meditation and mindfulness. So then slowly over time, uh, she got more and more into it and used it at her house, not just within the school setting. And then she got involved in yoga. So um, we're still friends to this day, like mentor-mentee relationship. Um, but she's never gone back to like having to be Baker acted and she actually got off of her medication. So yeah, it's, it's something that's super powerful to me and those are scenarios that keep pushing me into study it further. Right, wouldn't that be cool if we could all find mindfulness and meditation when we were little kids? That's like, my goal. How much would that help us into exactly. our adult life and bullying and all the crazy stuff that's happening in right. the country? And, and even just with like the brain, like if you, if you introduce mindfulness at that age, then there's so, like your brain actually grows, like it, it stops growing uh, at the age of 25, but the things that are happening in your brain in that time, um, mindfulness enhances and it takes out a lot of the, like anxiety, depression, and stress, they actually stop and hinder brain development, which is crazy. So if you think about it, like if you talk to like any elementary student today, uh, they'll probably tell you that they're stressed, especially since this is the testing season that we're in right now. They're <laughs> like, yeah, season. testing season, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> buzzword. So yeah, every kid, like they start to stress out more and more. Um, so if you think about it, the um, I forget the exact percentage, but what I was studying is um, the higher rates of stress and anxiety and depression continually increasing over time. Um, so that's, it's hindering brain development. So it's not just the social emotional component, it's also like what's going on up here. So it could be so transformational. And it definitely was for me, even at the fine old age of 22, when I first started yoga, or actually first started mindfulness. I kind of started yoga about age 18, but wasn't fully into the practice. Yeah, yeah, let's so, go into that. How did you get here from yoga? Well, initially, a lot of like what I was doing for exercise is running, and I played volleyball for a really long time. Um, but when I went away to college, you know, there's so many classes that you can take at the rec center. Um, it's free, I'm like, oh, I, I have time. Like, I, I'm just gonna go check it out. So my undergraduate experience was not really the typical experience for most people. Um, when I went away, like I was, a, I was in a very, um, I went to private school all my life. So it was like more of a closed minded, like very protected space. So when I went to a public university, like it was like mind blowing. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know how to react to this. <laughs> so it's, um, I used negative coping tools, unfortunately. Well, I, should, I shouldn't say unfortunately because it did make me a stronger person. What does that mean, negative coping tools? So negative coping tools meaning like, um, like my, I went into my depression, I went into like higher stress, anxiety, and then I started using my eating disorder, like my eating disorder developed right when I went to um, my public university. So it started right in freshman year, and like it just kind of went like like boom like full blown in just like a year so yoga comes into the story when i saw that a lot of like my health was like it was rapidly declining and 
I said enough's enough. Like I went to so many hospital visits and was in the emergency room for so like so many times. I said, you know, I care about my life more than I care about like looking a certain way. So I ended up checking myself into a rehab center and um, I took a medical leave of absence while I was at, um, at my university. And I was like, okay, we're doing this, like enough's enough. Um, so I, was in, I ended up in rehab for about three months and it was um, for my, specifically for my eating disorder, but a lot of um, what I started to uncover was there was a lot of other things going on, which is typically the case for an eating disorder. Um, a lot of like personal stuff that I had experienced that I had never addressed in my life. Um, so this is where the yoga comes in. Like I was introduced to it in college with all those rec classes, but I didn't ever take it seriously. I was like, oh, okay, well, this is the only class available. Like I'll go try this. But when I was down in my rehab center, it was literally the only thing that we were allowed to do exercise wise. Because one of the things that I ended up having as part of the disorder was an exercise addiction, um, which manifested itself in different ways. And um, you know, the other part of my disorder was bulimia and anorexia. So when I saw yoga, like the the <laughs> my brain automatically just said, "Oh, exercise! I'm definitely going to do that." Most people do see it as exercise. Yeah, exercise. exactly, and that's what I saw it as. So. Um, it wasn't it wasn't a vinyasa or power class. It was restorative yoga, and my brain like automatically. I, I hated it at first because I thought, you know, we're not even moving. Like, why are we even doing this? But over time, my body grew to need it, and my mind grew to love it. And I thank God for that experience that I had. Because not only did it start to heal my body physically, but um, the rehab center and then offering yoga really started to transform me, like I said earlier with my students, socially, emotionally, and of course mentally. So it got me back to my baseline. And it took a lot of work to get there. Like three months is not very typical. Like it's usually on average about a month but I'm just so stubborn that I, you know, it's like, no, I wanna keep this disorder. Like, this is my life, this is all I know. But when they slowly started introducing new things to me and I saw that there was so much more than like what I knew and what I had created with my disordered life, that I wanted to get rid of it and start using the coping tools that they had taught me instead. So once I got out of rehab, that's kind of where the true work begins because you're in this isolated environment that's, um, it's, it's made to feel safe. So once I got back out, um, out of rehab and I went back home, um, my therapist that I saw back home, she said, Kelsey, you're not gonna go back and finish school. Like I guarantee you, your eating disorder is gonna come full blown. Yeah, yes. yeah, I, I said, oh, okay. Thanks for the support. Yeah, thanks for the support. But then that's when I said, okay, I'll show you. And I ended up going back to the university that actually like where I developed my eating disorder. And I started pursuing yoga like every day, every day I was in a class and it didn't matter what type of class it was. I knew that that was like where my baseline would lie. So I ended up actually graduating on time, which was insane. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think I could do it. Like my past self didn't think I could do it. My new self had more encouragement, but I would definitely say that yoga and meditation was one of the things that got me through and able to accomplish my goal. So it's a, yeah, yeah, that's kind of, again, there's a lot of stories with, um, like with anybody, but the story is just so good. Like I, it's just, you know, the more elements of like work that you add to it, like the more that my story means so much more to me because I had to actually work for it. Um, like nothing good ever comes easy. Exactly, so what would you say to someone who might be going through something or might have gone through something or might be going through something right now that you went through with um, depression or mm -hmm. eating disorders? How, what advice would you give to them that, what advice would you give to them? Yeah. <laughs> it's. Well, I think it depends on the individual, of course. 
Um, there's really not a blanket statement that you like, like that's the cure all, but I would definitely say that connection to yourself is the utmost thing that's gonna allow you to move deeper in. Um, and connection looks differently for everybody. Like for me, it starts with the breath. And it's like the most basic tool ever. And you're like, oh, all I have to do is breathe, that's it. But really, it's like the natural biological function that acts as this gateway to connection to who you are. But it's not just like, oh, breathe in, breathe out. You have to actually, you have to notice it and be aware. So whatever gets them to connect fully to themselves, like I would say that the most basic tool would be the breath. But if they find something that they enjoy, um, that gets them out of their, uh, it's almost like OCD headspace continually thinking about these thoughts and, um, you know, anxiety is like this obsession over like, you know, trying to accomplish something or depression, it's usually OCD about like your suffering, like what's going on in my life that's experiencing suffering for me. So when you take yourself out of that picture, um, that self-obsession, the obsession, obsessive thoughts, um, it really allows you to transcend your own experience. And like for me, it's the breath, but whatever works for them, I would encourage them to develop coping tools that they feel comfortable with, uh, that they are able to easily access every single day and go with it. Awesome, <laughs> that's great. Um, for You do a lot of work with PBS Kids. Yes. Yeah, so how did you get into that and what is your experience with teaching like younger, younger okay. kids? Yeah, and that's very different than teaching an adult class for sure. <laughs> so um, PBS Kids just, everything happens for a reason and PBS Kids just naturally fell into my hands um, and I'm forever grateful for that. So when I left to um, go pursue my doctorate, I ended up wanting to take another teacher training. So I had my first teacher training, I think it, this mind blown moment, light bulb, teacher training is probably one of the best things that you can do because it leads to so many further opportunities. Like the first one led me to the realization that mindfulness and education works. The second one leads me to the opportunity with PBS. So I did my second uh, certification to get my 500. And some of the people that I met in there, they're always, like they're your support system. So I ended up having a conversation with one of the producers for the local PBS station here in Orlando. And I was telling her my area of interest and saying, okay, this is what my um, doctorate's gonna be centering around is just mindfulness and kids. And she immediately latched on to that and said, okay, like, what do you think that we could do with that? How can we develop this into something that would be bigger and reach every single household in this community? So it just simply started with a conversation at teacher training. And then kind of the rest is history, where I started filming the first season, the first season really caught on, and now we're in our fourth season. And we're being sponsored by the Early Learning Coalition and uh, Florida Hospital. So it's things that the community now sees as really valuable um, and just trying to get more of that content out now. So this, the show, I wouldn't say I directly teach kids like on the screen. It's more like, um, like it's like Mr. Rogers where he's talking to the child that's watching the show. So I always, I don't look from side to side unless I have another character with me but I always talk directly to the TV. And that's one of the things that um, allows me to teach directly to the child because they see the engagement that I'm giving them, which like we all want connection in some way, shape or form. And as a child that's watching the show, it's aimed about zero to five years old is our demographic. So they see a person on the TV screen and they think I'm real, they think I'm actually there and they immediately get up and try yoga poses or work on breathing and being mindfully aware of the breath. And it's, um, I think that the best thing that I've experienced thus far with the show is the feedback that I've received from kids and parents. Where like one of the, um, it was funny, like a, I think the, the two kids were about 11 months old, they were twins. 
So they, the parents come up to me and they're like, we watch your show all the time. Um, you know, our kids always like react to it as soon as the music comes on. And then as soon as I spoke to the kids, like they recognized my voice and they started like reacting. And um, so that was one instance. And then the other cool thing was um, the boy was, uh, he's on the spectrum that came up to me and he was about 12 years old and uh, his parents introduced him to me and they explained that he's actually learning English from my show. So he didn't understand like what I was saying directly to him, but when I said tree pose or racket pose, like he immediately reacted and spoke in English and he said, tree, racket, and he would do the pose with me. So it's something that's really awesome to see that kids are responding to it. But I would say that the biggest thing in teaching kids is making it relatable, making it understandable, and then the sense of connection that you form with that child because you don't know like if they're getting a connection at home or connection with their friends at school or wherever they may be. So it's, the, it's like the most basic human experience, but that's kind of what makes the show thrive. It's not like loud, flashy, like action features, but it's more because they see that I care about them and then I'm offering them positive coping tools or positive ways to grow at a very early age and it's just really engaging. So what are some examples of coping skills for any parents seeking help for how to communicate with their kids? I just had this conversation with the Early Learning Coalition and uh, what they experienced is they have viewed that parents don't know what to do for their child. So you don't have to go read a book. Like, you, I mean, it helps to read a book or look it up on a website, but really it's like the most basic coping skills that you can offer a child is attention, putting down the technology, um, and just listening to your child. Uh, so those are your basic coping uh, skills, but if something starts to evolve over time as they're growing, because you hit different milestones uh, throughout their early childhood, um, like with social, emotional, and mental understanding, um, that's when I would start to really reach out to the community. Because there's, like with the Early Learning Coalition, for example, um, they offer like where to go to find a doctor, where to go to find a speech therapist, like basic things that parents might not understand um, how to get extra help. So there are resources out there um, that are very positive. And it's just, all it takes is a simple Google. Um, as far as everything else goes with coping skills and like what I offer through yoga and mindfulness, um, typically, uh, and from what I've heard from parents um, from the feedback from my show, is the thing that's most helpful is getting them off the couch and moving, especially if they're like two, three, four years old. Like I think back to my childhood and I was constantly outside and moving around and uh, wanting to play but that's not the case for the 21st century child. It's very different. So anything that gets them to play and be creative, like even art or any other physical movement that they wanna do, that's gonna be something that's helpful that allows them to get rid of stress, anxiety, and even depression at even that early age. So anything that gets their mind activated allows them to connect to their emotional state and then develops creativity and gets their mind really working is something that, um, again, it's very basic because they're, they're early, they're, they're kids. You don't have to wow them with like all these coping skills that maybe adults could use. So it's just a basic understanding of providing an element of like freedom for the child. Freedom. I love that. And I love that you also mentioned you put super big emphasis on breathing. Yes. So for example, if you're going to talk to like a kid between like, I don't know, five and 10 years old and how would you, what would be a quick breathing exercise? Yeah. So, so this is one of the, um, this is actually part of the content for happy, healthy kids. So like I said, you have to make it relatable. And usually I like to bring something tangible into the students that I'm teaching or the kids that I'm teaching. And I call it my breath ball. So it kind of expands like the diaphragm or like the lungs when you inhale in and the, it's the, um, 
I forget what it's called. It's like, oh my gosh, it's, I'm blanking. Anyways, <laughs> so it's, it expands and then on your exhale, you deflate. The other quick way, if you don't have that fancy breath ball that I can't think of the name of right now. <laughs> um, honestly, it's connecting one hand to your belly. And yeah, and imagine it like a big balloon. So you're filling the belly up with air or your balloon up with air. And then can you make a hissing sound as you exhale like the balloon's deflating? So the body connection, you feel your body out and then you inhale, you fill up with air and it's automatic, like you connected to your body. You connected and we're more aware. And it's, or, or you could even incorporate not just the breath, because the breath is always gonna be there, otherwise we wouldn't be alive. <laughs> so another quick way for a child to really ground themselves, like the breath's an excellent tool, but even just like where they're sitting or where they're standing and pretend like they're a tree. Like the roots are your feet, your legs are the trunk, your upper body's the trunk, and if you wanted to get fancy, you could add branches. <laughs> yeah, fancy tree. <laughs> so anything that's gonna help them ground, because like if you think about it, like what do you think of when you think of kids? They're like really loud, playful, energetic. Like they're up here all the time. Like if you start to ground them, you're gonna get them back to their baseline, and uh, their parasympathetic nervous system starts to like ground immediately. And it's really cool to see. Like, like I, I have a bunch of kids come in because I teach um, a couple kids classes and they come out of school and they're like all wired. They want to play, they want to get their energy out and we do. But then by the very end of the class, I have to start, I don't have to, but I love to see them start to ground. The parents appreciate it too. So they start to calm down and it's just those easy techniques. Something that you can do anytime and anywhere. <laughs> you are the easiest person to interview. I just ask you a question and you just cover all the bases. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah, you so much. Course. Yeah, thanks for hanging out and chatting with me today. If people want to find you, where can they go on Facebook, Instagram, wherever? Yeah, so on social media, my Instagram handle is um, underscore Kelsey Evans underscore. And then social media, you can reach out um, to Kelsey Evans, or you can even reach out to WUCF TV, and it's under Happy Healthy Kids, that's the title of the show. Um, so those are my social media handles. Um, but if you're ever around at a studio, I teach at a couple in the Orlando area, you can always look my name up. And, um, or maybe just come out to the university and just say hi. Kelsey, thank you so much for coming on the show today. And guys, be sure to check her out. And be sure to tune in for the next episode of our podcast-like show.